Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert, Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. Listen, model health is about having health in all areas of our lives. All right, it's a compilation of things. First of all, there's a big difference between fitness and health to begin with, but true health is having health in our relationships, having physical health, having health with our finances, having spiritual health as well. So all of those things are a compilation of who we are and this life experience that we have. And we cannot have our tank on E in any of these areas and call ourselves truly healthy. And so it's been a big passion of mine to get the very best people on the planet to help enlighten us into how to have health in these different areas and also to give us those inside insights and inside strategies to really take our game and our lives to another level. All right, and today we're gonna be talking about something that I've done a couple of shows in the past, but this is gonna be coming from an entirely different perspective. And the story is incredible. And, and this man is a part of my family now, and it's just gonna blow you away. So put your big boy pants on, your big girl pants, get ready, tune in, lean in a little bit closer, and uh, just be ready. It's gonna be really, really enlightening. And here's why. So I want to share this with you guys. A report from the American Psychological Association found that stress about money and finances appears to have a significant impact on the health of many Americans. Specifically, financial stress has been found to be one of the biggest stressors in our world today. And going back and talking about healthy relationships, about one third of couples report that finances are a major source of conflict in their relationships. This is essentially saying that struggling with our finances is not a healthful way of being. Now, I know many of us even struggle with thinking that money is a value. And I personally, for me, impact is a big driving force of what I do. It's not money, but making sure that our financial lives are taken care of. So we're not cutting corners. We're not sacrificing our work, sacrificing our energy just because we need to get a bill paid. We've got to really learn like anything. If you want to get healthy, we have to make health a study. If you want to improve your finances, we have to make it a study. And learning from people who've done it before, especially if they come from a place of struggle, like many of us are in currently. And so what this does when we have a financial stress that goes into our overall stress load, because you hear something like that, that this is affecting our physical health. It's because we have this concept that I've been really working to impress upon our consciousness of our overall stress load, right? Exercise is super good for you, but it's also a stress. And if you put chronic, if you have chronic stress already, and then you say, you know, I'm going to train for a marathon, you could push yourself over the limit, right? And so what goes into your overall stress load is relationship stress, mental stress, emotional stress, work stress, family stress, financial stress. All of it goes into this overall stress load. And here's what can take place. A study published by the Journal of the American Medical Association, Internal Medicine, found that upwards of 80% of physician visits today are for stress-related illnesses, all right? Chronically elevated stress can increase your risk of heart attack, stroke, autoimmune diseases, obesity, cancer, and more. And so dealing with these different areas of our stress is a, is a huge uh, revelation for us to have today and to address these things appropriately because I want you to be able to have the financial health that you really want, to be able to do the things that you want in your life, to not cut corners, to be able to, you know, if there's something that you want to get involved in, I never want you to use money as a reason that you don't do something that you feel called to do in your heart anymore. And so today, again, we've got an incredible story and some incredible insights to help you in that dimension. But really quickly, obviously physical health is a big part of this equation too. And so for me, pretty much every day with my breakfast, I take a super critical extract of turmeric in a product called Daily Turmeric. And this is because number one, turmeric has been found in isolation, uh, curcumin compound found in high concentration, these super critical e extracts of turmeric has been found to have something called anti-angiogenesis properties. So what this means is that turmeric literally can cut off the blood supply to cancer cells, right? A cancer cell, a tumor, like anything else, it has to have a blood supply. It has to have nutrition in order to grow. And so this literally cuts that off, all right? How powerful is that? And we see cultures that consume a lot of turmeric or curry, they have very, very low rates of cancer, surprisingly. But now we have some clinical evidence of why is that? Why is it working? That's just one thing. Also, turmeric, and this was 
published in the 2006 issue of Life Enhancement. Scientists found that a uh, turmeric concentrate can aid against symptoms of sleep deprivation, such as impaired locomotor activity, memory dysfunction, depression, all things kind of associated with that. And they found that, and here's the, the key, taking it before, not after. So test subjects who took it before the sleep deprivation period show a significant decrease in all of those symptoms, all right? It's great for a lot of things. That's why I take it, all right? I highly recommend, head over there, check them out. Uh, it's daily turmeric from Organifi. Also, this is the main constituent of the Organifi Gold. You know, I'm a big fan of the green, the green juice product, the red juice, but the gold is fire as well. And also in there, you've got some reishi, which is great for your sleep as well. And coconut milk, it just tastes really good. All right, I recommend taking that with a little almond milk. Uh, my guy, E.T., who is a mutual family member, friend of ours, he takes it before bed. I think he does it with hot water, right? And it helps him sleep, you know? So he's the grind guy. He's the guy you hear about, I wake up at 3 a.m. Ah, that's, that's him, right? But here's the thing. People don't ask, when does he go to bed? He goes to bed early and he makes sure that his sleep hours are quality. All right, and this is one of the things he's doing is taking the gold. All right, so head over, check him out. It's Organifi.com forward slash model. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash model. You get 20% off everything, all right? 20% off. Again, head over, check him out. Organifi.com forward slash model. Now let's get to the Apple Podcast Review of the Week. Another five-star review titled Nothing Like It, Priceless by Emily River. I want to thank you, Sean, for your unremitting passion to improve all our lives. You are the rare truth seeker, putting the puzzle together as the health field is mostly just pieces. Your podcast came at such a perfect time in my family's life. As we began a new life in Australia, we decided to start over in all areas of our life and stumbled upon your podcast quite by accident. Not only do I look forward to your podcast, but it also keeps me sticking to my walks. Two health benefits in one. I can't think of a better way to spend my time. Thank you again from Down Under. You have made a difference. That is absolutely incredible. All the way in Australia, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for taking me on those walks with you. I love it. And listen, uh, that means everything to me, truly, truly. And if you've yet to do so, please pop over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for the show. All right, I appreciate that so very much. And it just puts a big smile on my face. So thank you. And on that note, let's get to our special guest and our topic of the day. Our guest today is my friend, Jamal King. And to tell you how I found out about him, it was from our mutual friend, CJ, who CJ's been on the show, I'll put his episode in the show notes. He dropped some huge nuggets. And I heard this story because he shared it with me before I heard him share this with the public. And he just really encouraged Jamal to share his story. And he, he was not looking for this, you know, like you're getting an exclusive interview from somebody that a lot of people uh, don't get access to. And it's because he wasn't, it wasn't his desire to be out and sharing everything. He was just kind of living his life and he stumbled upon some success principles that really helped. And so CJ shared this story and he was like, Jamal kept coming to all these events. And not only did he come to these different events at different cities across the country, but he would always get the VIP, right? He, he was always bringing people along with him. And eventually, cause you know, same thing, like we did this tour, the Take Control tour, which Jamal was on. And you start to notice, you start to see the people who are at the different events and you're just like, oh, wow, like you were about that life, you know? And he started to notice Jamal and he just eventually like struck up a conversation and he asked, so what do you do, right? And Jamal just like, I'm a police officer. Okay, end of story, moves on. He sees him again, same thing. Now eventually, and this is what CJ shared with me, they were doing an event in Florida. I think it was Miami, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. And people, you know, I guess people were hanging out later the night before and somebody came in and they were just like, you know, uh, and CJ asked, so where, where were you at last night? And he was like, well, I was on the yacht with Jamal. He had rented a yacht. And so CJ's putting two and two together. He's like, okay, so he's a police officer. Yacht. He must be like the officer from training day. He must be Denzel <laughs> Washington. He must be, he must be hitting the Denzel Washington, right? And so... He asked him, he pulled him to the side, he's like, man, you gotta tell me your story. And so we're gonna talk about some of that today and how he's so successful. He's built multiple companies as a police officer this entire time, 
Um, his story is just absolutely incredible and some huge insights. And I'd like to welcome to the show my friend Jamal King. What's up, man? What's up, bro? <laughs> How you doing, man? Doing good, man. Glad to finally get you here. Yes, yes. Glad to be here. Because for the last, when we had this schedule before, your daughter, yeah. right? Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Man, sure. Yeah. We were scheduled to come. And um, my daughter, Ayana, who plays tennis, um, she's a f true freshman, right? And so, you know, she's been taking tennis lessons. In high school. In high school. She's, right. a, she's a true freshman in high school. And so she tried out for the tennis team this year. And not only did she make it, but she made the varsity. Mm -hmm. And then she won second in conference. She took third in sectional. And then she was one out of 64 girls to actually make it downstate mm -hmm. as a true freshman. Incredible. Yeah. So she just kept winning. And so I hey, called you up like, hey, Sean, man, uh, I apologize for my daughter going downstate. And uh, you show love, man. You was just like, hey, bro, family first, you yeah. know? And that's 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 kind of, you know, what I would have expected you to say. But I definitely appreciate you having me back. Oh, man, it's yeah. totally my pleasure. And part of that story, I'm just going to give the heads up. So she, and by the, she's playing kids that are 18. They about to go to college. It's, it's just amazing, man. But you put her in position. Yes. You know, because of the things that you've done in your life, the investments that you've made, you're able to get that coaching for her, you know, yeah. to get those private lessons, to put her in positions for her greatness to really uh, shine at a different level, man. And so, uh, but how, all right? So, <laughs> you know, you got all of these companies, you know, you were, you've, you've generated millions of dollars, man. And, um, but you, you still haven't even retired from being a police officer. No, not yet, not yet. So I actually retire in a couple months, so. Yeah. How, man, let's get into it, man. How did this happen? So I know this started off football, yeah. right? This started off with the, the vision and dreams, like you thought she was gonna, Play football. That was going to be your life. Yeah, that was Let's it, man. That. I thought I wanted to be a millionaire, just like I bet you a bunch of other people. I've even heard you speak about this. So I wanted to be a millionaire, and playing football was going to be my way of doing it. And so, yeah, I ended up playing high school football, got a college scholarship to go to Division One, and I just knew it. I was like, okay, cool. Four years, I'm going to play, and then I'm going to the NFL. And my senior year came, and the NFL wasn't there for me, just like most people. You know, the other 99% of people that play, only 1% actually make it to the league. And so for me, I thought I was going to make it. I didn't make it. And pretty much that's when I always say that PTSD set in on me. Mm. You know, that's that post-traumatic sports disorder. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. not, not, not stress disorder, but post-traumatic <laughs> sports disorder. You know, where you just uh -huh. know that you're going. This is the only vision you have for yourself. And ever since I was six years old, I was going to make it to the NFL. I was going to buy my mother the house. I was going to give my dad that car. And I was going to just live, you know, as this big time millionaire playing in the Super Bowl. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And at that point, bro, I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself. And so I was lost. You know, my whole life, everybody always kind of said, hey, there's Jamal, the football player. Mm -hmm. After I wasn't playing football no more, I lost that last name, the football player. You know, now it's just Jamal King. And it was like, man, what am I going to do with myself? Here it is. This is the only vision I had for my life. And now that's gone. What am I going to do? I knew that I didn't want to be, you know, my parent. My dad was a Chicago police sergeant. My mother was a police officer. My brother was a police officer. And I knew that I didn't want to go into the family business of being a police officer. But I didn't know anything else to do. And so at that point, once I didn't make it to the NFL, I joined the family business. You know, became a cop. Man, man, that's... Man, but you know, the first thing that I just want to acknowledge, like you didn't have a backup plan, which is which is good in a yeah. sense, like you had all your targets moving towards one direction. And, but you know, kind of life played a different hand, but there's a big part of that story that you also, it wasn't just the football part, it was the wealth part, Yeah. right? Yeah. And this wealth part is a big driving force mm -hmm. of this whole situation. And you got a glimpse at what it could look like by, uh, going to a friend's place who did get drafted. Yeah, yeah, one of my college teammates, man. One of my college teammates, he actually made it to the NFL. He got drafted. And I always talk about exposure, you know? I always tell people about exposure. And my friend, he ended up getting drafted. And here I am, a police officer. I'm making $36,000 a year as a police officer. I was making $1,200 every two weeks. And my close friend, he was making $200,000 a week. I was oh. sitting back, shy. I was sitting back, man, like... I went to a couple of his games and I seen him. He was averaging like six, seven tackles, right? I was locking up six, seven felons a week. But yet he was making $200,000 a week while I'm making $1,200 every two weeks. And it was just, it was just mind blowing, you know? And then even going to visit him, he called me up one time out there. Um, uh, I got into 
a situation in Chicago. He called me up and said, hey, bro, you need to get away from Chicago. You can come visit me. And so I remember coming out to his house and he lived in this uh, gated community. And I remember just driving up to this gated community and the guard came out and talked to us. And I remember when he opened up those gates, it was like a whole new world, bro. I'm talking about, it was manicured lawns, it was mansions. You had the BMWs parked in the driveway. You had the Bentleys. And I'm just like, man, I ain't never seen nothing like this in my life. Well, I'm here in Chicago. The crazy part is in Chicago, in my circle, I was like the man. I had a job, right? I had a job with benefits. So all my guys, you know, they some of them didn't go to college. So some of them, they were making minimum wage or whatever. They were making seven, eight dollars an hour. And here it is. I got thirty six thousand dollars with benefits, a pension. So they always looked at me like I was the man. But then I stepped outside my circle and I got with my guy who's making over two hundred thousand dollars a week. And I saw what money looked like. I saw that next level. And I said, wow, like here it is all this time. I've been in my circle and I've been living a lie. Right. I've been thinking that I was the man in my circle. I was thinking that I was well off. I thought that I was doing for my family, but it wasn't until I went to that community and I seen people and they were living a different kind of way. You know, it seemed like the air even smelled different in that area. <laughs> you know, it was cleaner. Right. Everything about that area, man, was just and I always go back to it. And it's crazy because I remember saying to myself, I didn't even go to his house yet. I remember just driving and I remember saying to myself, man, this is how I want to live. I seen the people out there walking in the walking their kids. Some of the kids was going to school. They had the plaid outfits, right? You know, you knew they went to private school. I seen the, the wives out there and they were just all talking. It was during the daytime, so some of them should have been at work, right? Mm. But they were just looked like they just was having a good time. Like they didn't have any stresses in life. And I was just like, man, it don't look like that where I'm from. You know, the the the, the husband and the wife both have to work. You know, the children going to public school. And ain't nothing wrong with public school, but it's just the uniform that these kids had just looked a little bit different, you know? And I just remember saying to myself, like, man, I want this. And I didn't even get to his house yet. I was just in, just driving down the street. And I knew that I wanted my house to look like this. I wanted a mansion, but I knew that I could never get it while making $36,000 a year as a police officer. Mm, man, this just reminds me. And, you know, say what you will about Kanye, I'm not trying to endorse anybody, but he had this line, having money's not everything, but not having it is. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, our same thing, you know, I grew up in a situation, um, you know, very similar to, to, to you and to many people listening. You know, I, we got free food from food pantries, you know yeah. what I'm saying? We grew up on food stamps and it was a big struggle, you know, just even the cons, like I didn't have any exposure. I didn't have any examples. Mm -hmm. I was just joking about the other day, uh, I did an Instagram post, but I used to see that lifestyles of the rich and famous. Mm -hmm. It just seems like it was fake, right? Yeah. You know, people eating, like putting these little fish eggs mm -hmm. on the, on the, the cracker. The I'm just like, I was like, which people, rich people weird. Yeah. Like, why would you do that? Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't until I started to get out of that circle and change the exposure. So you already dropped one nugget, but we're going to dive deeper because you, you're you going to share five of your of your keys, these principles right. that have helped you kind of, you know, achieve what you have. But before that, you mentioned there was an incident. So you got to talk about this, man, because yeah. this is kind of like a catalyst moment for you. Uh, was you, you was just fresh onto the job, right? Yeah, yeah. I was fresh on the job. So after my NFL dreams um, kind of went to a halt. I joined the police department and I was just two months out of the academy. And it was a routine call, right? I was working midnights in Chicago um, in this community called Gresham. And I just remember me and my partner, it was, a, it was a quiet night and we were working midnights and we got a call, you know, just a curfew, kids outside hanging out. So we like, okay, yeah, we'll take that call, routine call, nothing big. And so we go, I'm working with a guy who's been on the job for a while, he's like an old timer. And we pull up and we see like five kids outside. And so we're like, okay, cool. Let's go ahead. Let's talk to them. You know, let's get them off the street. Make sure they don't get in any kind of trouble. Anything happens to them. So I get out the car and I go to one kid in particular. And I'm like, you know, I ask him his age. He tell me his age. He tell me he's 15. I was like, okay, cool. You know, hey, we're going to take you guys home. You know, make sure you guys get home safely. I go to the kid to pat him down because anytime you put a kid in your car or anybody in your car, you know, you want to make sure that they don't have a weapon on them or anything. So I put the kid, I, pat, I, I turn the kid around, I go to pat him down. The kid turns around and pushes me, takes off running. So, you know, I just was training for the NFL, right? So, you know, I'm in tip top shape. I'm like, man, look, you know, so I'm like, kid, you really want to do this? Like, you really want to do this? So he takes off running. And so I'm chasing after him. My partner, he an old timer, he hops in the squad car and we're running down this alley. 
And man, it seemed like it was just yesterday. It was just pitch black. The kid take off running. I'm following right behind him. He dips in between these two apartment buildings. He can't go left, can't go right. Only thing he can do is go forward. And it's this huge fence with Bob wire on the top of it. And um, I'm like, hey kid, I got you. You know, like, hey, come on. So the kid jumps on top of the fence. I go, grab the kid, trying to pull him down from the fence because he's cutting himself in the barbed wire. So as I go to grab him to pull him down, the kid reaches in his waistband, pulls out a Tech 9, and points it to my head. Now, I mean, just imagine that feeling, bro. Here it is. I'm thinking that I, you know, I want to be a millionaire. I'm joining the family business. My dad had been on the job for over 25 years at that time, never been in a shooting, never had anything like this happen to him. And now all of a sudden, this kid pulls out a gun and points it right to my head. I remember like just reaching up and grabbing his hand at the same time when he pulls the trigger and the bullets go over my head because I'm holding the guy, I'm holding his hand and the gun, you know, away from my head and the kid is holding down the trigger. So I got bullets ringing over my head. My partner at the time pulls up. He sees bullets going off, but he can't see, he can't see me. He can't tell if that's me getting shot at or if the guy's shooting. And so my partner pulls out his gun and then starts to fire. I fall to the ground. Instantly, the kid falls over to the other side of the fence and drops his gun where we're at. And my partner lets off 16 shots. So now to anybody else, 16 shots is kind of like, oh man, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's scary. That's traumatic. Here it is. This kid shot at me. My partner shot 16 times. The scariest part was, though, when we called in a chase and the supervisors came on the scene and the supervisors was like, hey, you know, you guys OK? And we're like, yes, sir. We're good. The supervisor was like, OK, great. Well, yeah, we'll get the kid. He got away. We'll get him. We got his gun. But we got one little problem. And I'm like, what's that, Sarge? He was like, your bullets have possibly killed someone in that apartment building that's directly across the street. When you guys fired your weapon, now keep in mind, I didn't fire anything. My right. partner did. Right. But your partners. Mm -hmm. So you do something, then you guys are together. So he's like, yeah, now what we need to do is we need to go into this building and make sure nobody is dead off of what you guys possibly have done. <laughs> Bruh, so they take us, they separate us, they take me, put me in the back of a squad car. And here it is, I'm a rookie, right? They take my partner, the veteran, they put him in another squad car. They take our weapons from us. And the radio is just silent at the time. You can't hear anything. And they tell everybody, stay off the radio. And so the commander gets the call to kick in the door if nobody answers the door. So now here it is. I got my radio. I'm sitting in the back of the squad car. I got my radio. Now you can hear everything that's taking place. And it was like it was in slow motion. And they're like, unit number one. And you could hear them knocking on the door, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody answers, of course. Commander gets the call, kick the door in. They kicked the door in, and you could hear them on the radio saying, Chicago police, is anybody here? Is anybody hurt? Call out. Of course, you don't hear anything. So then all of a sudden, they go around the apartment, then they come back, and they're like, you know, unit number one, it's clear. Nobody's in here. This apartment building had 18 units. Mm. So I'm sitting here all this time going through this, and I'm thinking to myself like, man, I know that the police department wasn't the NFL, right? But... I, at least I was going to get job security. At least I was going to get benefits. I was supposed to get like a pension. But in that moment, while I was sitting in the back of that squad car, everything was jeopardized. I wasn't even on a job for two years yet. Ten years. I was only on a job for two months. And my whole way of life was jeopardized at that very moment. And it was just like, come on, man. I, I'm supposed to do this for the next 20, 30 years? I'm supposed to be able to build my family with this kind of pressure? For the next 20, 30 years, if something would have happened, my whole livelihood would have stopped at that very moment. So now all of a sudden, unit number 15, <laughs> nobody answers the door. They go in, kick the door in, and they find some people in the unit, but these people are okay. Mm -hmm. And so they finally get to the last unit, that 18th unit, and lo and behold, thank God, everybody was safe, everybody was counted for. The supervisors come back to the squad car, open up the door, Pat me on the back and say, good job, rookie. Good job. Sean, after that moment, man, I was done. I was done before my career even started. I was like, at this moment right here, I have to find another way. Because job security is not secure like everybody teaches you. Right. Like we've been told. Right. 
Get a good job, get a pension, get a career. The job will take care of you. That's a lie. You got to take care of yourself. And I learned that at that very moment. Man, that's, man, that story, that's, that's crazy, man. That's, yeah. that's absolutely crazy. And I'm, even as, as this is processing, man, I was just like, I'm glad you're all right. I know you're here. You've been through, you know, <laughs> this, the story has a, has a pretty good ending. Uh, spoiler alert. But at the same time, man, just the, the situations that we find ourselves in. And it's just for many of us, we don't learn the lesson. And like yeah. you said, you were done. A lot of us, it's, it's not when the decision, it's not that the decision is hard. The decision takes like a second, like when you decide to change your life. And so. But Sean, if I could say this, yeah. when I said that I was done, I know a lot of people, they say, okay, he was done work. Why weren't you done working the police department? See, when I was done, I was done with the mindset that I'm going to let this job just take care of me for the rest of my life. Right. I wasn't going to cut off my income stream. That was the one stream of income, and I wasn't going to cut that off. So I was done with depending on this job for the rest of my life. Right. At that moment, I said I need to come up with other ways to have a backup plan and then have another backup plan and then have another backup plan. Yeah. So I was done with that mentality, but I wasn't finished working as a police officer. <laughs> and we'll get into that too, man, because that was my first question too, after finding out all of the things that you've achieved, like, why is he still, we'll get to that. But um, like you said, job security isn't secure. We live in an entirely different world today where, yeah. you know, our grandparents, maybe they could work at the same place for, you know, some decades, but today everything is so volatile and we have a tendency towards, you know, even the traditional education is creating people to think in terms of working for, a boss yeah. and then like this company is going to take care of you. But the reality is we've got to diversify things, you know, and not put all of our, all of our eggs into one basket. And so with that said, things begin to change. You had to change in your mindset. You had that exposure. What did you do that was kind of like the first domino that started to knock over, you know, building this empire you've built? Man, I would say the first thing I did, I went and I researched real estate. Right. I remember just always saying that I would see people that own real estate in the community growing up and I would always see them driving a certain kind of car. Right. I would see them always living a certain kind of way. And I wonder, why is it that most people in my community only live or rent in a certain place? But yet I've seen other people have multiple properties. Right. And so for me, I went ahead and I said, you know, this is real estate seems pretty attractive. And I knew that I didn't have to physically be there. So I always wanted to come up with a way that I could make income, but not physically have to be there. And so that's when I bought my first property. And I went and I looked at 77 properties before I actually purchased my first property. 77. 77. The reason why I looked at 77 properties is because I wanted to be very intentional. I did What I did, I wrote down every single thing, right? I wrote down everything in my life where if anything happened to me, my house would still be taken care of. My car was still be taken care of. So for me, it wasn't really about real estate. It was about a lifestyle. And so what I did, I wrote down all of my debt. I wrote down my house note. I wrote down my car note. I wrote down my, my, my wife's uh, salary that she makes on her job. I wrote down everything, our food items, every bill that we had. I wrote that down and I put in a number attached to, that, to, that, to all those bills. And that number came out to $5,000. And so I said, okay, I need to residually make $5,000 to take care of my lifestyle. So if I ever get into a shooting again, or if anything ever happens to me again, then I know that my lifestyle would be taken care of for the rest of my life, right? My wife wouldn't have to go get a second job if something happened. If I would've got shot that night and, and, and been laying up in the hospital, what would happen to my family? What would've happened to our livelihood? So I want to make sure that the properties that I look at would take care of my day-to-day my, my -day debt. So I always say, I bought a building for every bill that I had. And so at that point, the first property, I was looking to take care of my house note. And so it took us 77 properties. I literally went and looked at 77 properties. I was very intentional. This property that I bought was going to have to take care of my house note. That was first and foremost. I wanted to make sure our house note was taken care of. And so at that point, I found a four-unit apartment building in Chicago. And so a four-unit apartment building is, is four units, right? This property cost me $125,000. I only had to put $25,000 into it to fix it up. And so that total loan amount was $150,000. I only had to put down 10% of that. 
And so I only had to put down 15,000. At the time, they gave us a uniform allowance. The police department gave us uh, different kind of uh, loans that they would give us just for being a police officer, you know, for a first time home buyer, they would give us a loan. And so I took my money that the police department usually give you for uniforms and things. And I used that as my down payment on my first piece of property. And so this property here was renting, I was renting it for $1,000 per unit. And my mortgage wasn't nothing but $1,000 a month. And so here it is, I was making $1,200 every two weeks as a police officer, but I was netting $3,000 a month as a real estate owner on my first property. And I was 22 years old. So after I did that, I was like, okay, wait a minute, man, this is not making sense. How is it that I'm going to work every single day? I'm getting shot at, right? And I'm making $1,200 every two weeks. But I bought this piece of property. I put $25,000 worth of improvements into this property. And then I'm renting this property out to people that need a place to live. They pay me the first of the month. I take a portion of that payment and pay the bank. And then now the rest goes in my pocket. Mm. And the money that's going in my pocket is more money than what I'm making on my job from working 40 hours a week. I was like, man, this is, this is, this, this don't seem right. They didn't teach me this in school, <laughs> yeah, right, right? right? This right. ain't what they taught us in school. Right. Where is this? How, how is that even possible? Right. And so after I did the first one, I said, okay, well, cool. Wait a minute. So I'm making $3,000. I'm netting $3,000 a month. Let me try this again. And so then that's when I went ahead. I refinanced that building. I pulled some cash out and then I went and bought a six unit apartment building, right? I was like, okay, I got four units right here and I'm making $3,000. Let me go buy a six unit building. And so the second property I bought was a six unit building and I was making, I was netting $5,000 from this six unit building. So here it is, I'm 23 years old now and I'm netting $8,000 collectively between my two buildings. And I'm still making $1,200 every two weeks as a police officer. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, yeah. That's powerful, man. That's so powerful. And so from there, you continue. So for, let's just jump to it. So how many how many properties do you have now? Well, I look at units. So right now I have over 118 units. Okay, wow. Units, yeah. Wow. So in real estate, we count we count doors. Yeah. You know, so 118 people give rent right. for the first of the month. That's nuts, man. Yeah, yeah. And at some point you decided to diversify. So you did, wasn't just in the real estate, then you went, what was the other well, thing? Well, you know you what, Sean, I don't, I don't really look at it like diversification, right? I don't look at it like diversifying. I look at it like create multiple streams of income. Right. And so what we did after we bought, after we bought the, after we bought the third property, then that's when uh, my wife at the time, she was a school teacher and we was having my first child, Ayana the one that we just talked about in tennis. And so we were having her and my wife kind of wanted to have an identity. She wanted to stop working at, for the school system, but yet she wanted to do her own thing. Mm. And so since I was in real estate already, I was like a church came available and I was like, you know, have you ever thought about, you know, start a daycare? And she didn't know nothing about it. She was like, oh, well, and I was like, man, that way you can have our daughter. Cause she didn't want to just put our kid off to a daycare center or anything like that. I was like, you can still have our daughter and you can, you know, have your own business, have your own school. This is what you do. And she was like, well, that sounds like a good idea. You know, my wife is kind of a chameleon. And the mm -hmm. funny thing is her name is Camille and she's a chameleon, oh, wow. meaning where she's <laughs> just that supportive type, right? Yeah. And she's kind of like, uh, well, you know, whatever you decide. And so we started this daycare center. You know, we, I renovated it. It was a church, turned it into a daycare center. And the thing about it, we knew nothing about daycares, right? Nothing. We didn't know how much daycare centers made. We didn't know anything. All we knew is that we had this huge building and it had teddy bears in it, books in it, and it looked like a daycare center. And so at the time, we started off with just two kids, my daughter, Ayana, and my brother's son, Matthew. And neither one of them was paying us any money, right? <laughs> so we was just like, yeah. you know, we just like, we got this huge business, uh, this huge building with no income. And within, a, within two months time period, we had over 50 children in that business. We had over 50 children in there in two months time period, and we knew nothing about childcare, nothing at all. Those 50 kids was bringing us in about $40,000 a month. And then within, within a year's time, that building started generating over $100,000 a month. Now here it is, we're bringing in $8,000, we're netting $8,000 from our real estate, right? Which is taking care of all our debt. And now we're bringing in over $100,000 a month from these daycare centers. 
And so after I, after the first daycare center worked, we did the same thing like we did with the day with the real estate. We was like, well, if it works with that, let's do another one. And so we bought a cleaners at the time that was right across the street. We renovated that before the property was even finished. That property that daycare center was already filled to capacity. And so that daycare center started making us sixty thousand dollars. So now here it is. We have two daycare centers making us over one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. And yet at that time, I might have been making like fifty thousand dollars a year with the police department. That's blowing my mind. And even, you know, we can get caught up in in these numbers, man. Yeah. But, you know, like it, this was a a lifestyle change for you, you know, and Absolutely. also a change in your mindset. It continued to grow and you kept seeing the bigger picture. Like, okay, if this is working, because this is one of the things that I see with entrepreneurs and I've done too, is that we find something that works and we stop doing it. Yeah. Right. But you're seeing this pattern and you're growing and you're uh, instead of diversification, multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. And so you've got the real estate, you've got the daycares. So just a real quick glimpse, security company, yeah, yeah. right? So, yeah, so, that's yeah. what your brother, that's this what brother that's in here. The brother that's in here. Uh -huh. Yeah, so my brother was a sergeant. Yeah, He is a sergeant with the Illinois State Police. Right. And uh, my brother was working part-time job at the part-time job, you know, to make ends meet. Here it is, you have a guy that's making over $140,000 salary, but yet he was still working part-time jobs just to have that certain kind of lifestyle for his family. And so um, I was like, hey, bro, you know, you know all about security. You know all about part time. That's what you do for your part time. You do security for other people. You know, we can do our own. You know, here it is. We're police officers. Right. Like, hey, we can start our own security company. And so at that time, um, me and my brother, we started Illinois Security Professionals and I took money from the real estate. And that's how we had our startup money. And I invested it into getting contracts, uniforms, and things like that with the security company. And within a year's time, the first year we made over $100,000, right? Not knowing anything about a security company. And then in year number two, we made an upwards of $2 million. And so, you know, but, but even though we're doing multiple streams of income, the big thing was the vision that came along with these multiple streams of income. Yeah. And I think a lot of people miss that. You know, the same way how I had to revert back to when I was a kid, I had a vision of myself playing football. You know, you have to have a vision for yourself also and whatever business it is that you want to do. Right. So we had visions. We saw exactly what it is we wanted. You don't have to have really the knowledge in the beginning. You just got to have that vision and you got to stick to that vision and then let the vision develop the business. Right. Man, that's so, so good, man. It's something I'm going to talk more about, but this concept of, it being perfect, you know? And so you didn't have all the knowledge. Not you just all. got started. Not at all. Bro. You know? And so let's let's dive in now. Yeah. So people hear this incredible story, but there are certain principles that you were able to extract and that you've been teaching, you know, at our different events. And it's just been riveting. Like you got people just losing their minds and also people applying what you've been teaching and just having yeah. this huge transformation in their lives. And of course, I want to talk about fitness too, Absolutely. by the way. But so let's dive in and talk about some of these principles. I think we're going to, you brought five for us that you're going to share. I did. Of, I think you got like, is it eight or 10 of them? It's, it, it, it's, it's probably about 15 now. Okay, but. okay. <laughs> yeah, but these yeah. are some of the big, big hitters here. So let's dive in and give some kind of actionable things for people. Yeah, so so one of them in particular that I love, you know, to talk about all the time is your level of exposure determines your level of success. Your level of exposure. You're always being exposed to something. If you think about it, right? You know, what are you exposing yourself to? You know, better yet, what are you exposing your children to? Mm. You just think about it. You know, exposure. You're always exposing yourself to something. And so that's why I I always read you know, I'm always making sure that I'm listening to the right thing. I'm always my circle of influence. You know, that's why hanging out with guys like yourself, you know, ET, just being around you, I've learned so much. You know, I've learned that if you eat two green leafy vegetables a day, it will help you live 11 years to your life, right? It adds 11 years to your life. Did I say it right? You you, you there, man. You absorbing it. But Exposure. That's it. But you just exposed Exposure, me to it. Yeah. But back at home, I got buddies that's like, hey, bro, let's get a couple cheeseburgers, you know? Right, so right. if two green leafy vegetables... Will add to your life. What will eating two cheeseburgers do to your life? Probably take a, away a few days. But that's the difference between exposure. <laughs> right. Just by knowing you, I've added to my life possibly. So that's what exposure can do. That's how powerful exposure is. So your level of exposure determines your level of success. With my daughters, I had them around tennis players. You know, I took my daughter just this summer to Harvard tennis camp. I wanted her. She said that she wanted to play tennis. This is what she wants to do. You know, she wanted to be a great tennis player. She wanted to play tennis in college. So I had her look past high school, right? 
I didn't take her to the best high school tennis camp. We took her to the best college tennis camp. So that when she goes to high school now, she's been exposed already to that college level. So she already has that college mentality in her. She knows what she's playing for. So that level of exposure that we gave her at Harvard now transpired in her season in high school. And that's why she played like a college player. So her level of exposure determined her level of success. Man, so this, and real talk, this is where we met, is the environment, you know, that different exposure, putting yourself, you're somebody who took action, was going to these events. What inspired that for you to start doing that? To like go in and invest in your time and your energy to go into events with ET and the team? Yeah, well, back at home, you know, back at home, I, my, my circle, bro, I'm telling you, I used to sit up and tell my wife, like, I prayed that God changes my circle because I didn't have people that was around me that was actually like, like had the same mentality I had, right? I had people that, that kind of was just like, yeah, I just want to work a job and, you know, and, and, and pay my bills. And then, you know, whatever money's left over, you know, just, just take that. Or people that was looking to live check to check. I wanted more. And for me, it wasn't about the money, right? It's about the options that money give. It's about the options. It's about positioning my family. So I was like, I need to, I'm not the only person that's thinking like this. It's got to be somebody else out here that thinks the way I think. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to these conferences, and I'm meeting people like yourself, and I'm hearing you talk, right? And I'm seeing you with your son. I was on a cruise with you, and I saw you with your children. I seen you with your wife. I wanted to be around other men that love their wives, guys that really look to their wife and say, man, this is my boo. You know, this is the woman I love. And that guys that's on that other stuff talking about, hey, man, let's get away from our wives. You know, let's go hang out here. I wanted to be around like-minded people. And so once I start coming to the conferences, I start meeting like-minded people. And I said, man, this is crazy. I got to go all the way outside of Chicago to find pe other people that look like me or talk like me or act like me. People that love their children, people that invest in their children. And so the more I went to these conferences, the more I kept running into people like yourself, like CJ. Every time I get around CJ, he would always ask me, how's my family doing? I'm like, that's crazy. Here it is. I got buddies that live next door to me. And they ain't never asked me about my family. But yeah, I'm going to these conferences. This man keep asking me about my wife, my children. I was like, man, this is something different. So then I kept coming. Every time I see E, mm -hmm. always ask me about my son. Always ask me about my family. And I was just like, man, this is the circle that I want to be around. Not just that I want to be around. This is the circle that I need to be around. Yeah. Because it's good for me. And I knew that I was good for them. You know, we got this term we always say, iron sharpens iron. Every time I get around them, they sharpening my iron. Every time I get, they get around me, I'm sharpening their iron. You need to su surround yourself with people that sharpens your iron, you know? Either somebody sharpening your iron or they dulling your blade. Mm. 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 You know, people can yeah. be so, so, so taxing on you right. that, that, that you just feel drained. But I was like, let me go to these conferences. Let me get around like-minded brothers and every time I go to the conferences, bro, I would just be feeling like I'm just energized, right? I'd be ready to take on the world. And then I would come back to Chicago and I would share my experience with other people. Yeah. That's so, what it's about, man. Yeah. That's what it's about. So changing that exposure, getting out, physically getting yourself in a different environment. Also, the books that you're reading, the, the social media. Yeah. Um, the messages that you're exposing yourself to, all of that really helps to change your perspective and, and give you new exposure. So thank you for that one, man. So that's number one. What's another one? So these are, these are, these are real talk. These are some of the lessons that I've been learning from you as well. And these are the, uh, the keys to the kingdom, mm -hmm. Jamal King. So number one is exposure. Number two. Operate with a millionaire's mindset. Mm. A millionaire mindset. understands that time is your greatest asset. Time. See, in the police department, we, uh, we had this thing called the hole, right? And so the hole is where a police officer, whenever you're out there working and you're just trying to get away from the public, let's say that you're not really busy, you know, you just got a lot of downtime, the hole is where a police officer tries to get away. And you just maybe dip off to like behind a building and during, or, or even in the park, right? And then during that time, you're like either on social media, you know, you're watching movies, you know, you could be listening to music. But what I noticed when a lot of officers was in a hole, they were wasting time. They was wasting time in the hole. But see what they thought they were getting over, right? They like, oh man, I don't have to do any work. I don't have to answer any calls. I'm about to watch these movies. I'm about to, you know, eat just these get on social, donuts. Eat these donuts, right? Stereotypes. <laughs> exactly, <yeah>. right? <laughs> I'm about to eat these donuts. They did all that in the hole. 
right? But when I was in a hole, I would read books about real estate. When I was in a hole, I would get my real estate listings the day before and I would tell my partner, hey, you hop in the passenger seat. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna drive to these properties. And so when my partner, he was sleeping, eating donuts, you know, on social media, I would go to these properties. And those 77 properties I talked about, I did that in the hole. And so one funny thing that I noticed is that whatever an officer did in the hole, he became. So if you had an officer that just did and did nothing but watch movies all the time, he was an expert on movies. He mm. was a guy to go to about every single movie mm. you want to know about. If you had somebody that was in a hole that always ate donuts or drunk coffee, Dunkin' Donuts, you know, they would always go to Dunkin' Donuts and just hang out there. It showed in their body. But then when I go to the hole, I was looking at properties. I was going over my business plan. I was educating myself. I did all of that in the hole. You know, so I always say, man, my superpower is my time management. You know, everybody gets 24 hours. Right. What you do with your 24 hours is so critical. And you're always doing something, whether you're sleeping, whether you're on social media. I mean, if you just think about social media, the average person probably on social media about what? I don't have any social media, by the way. Two to so three hours a day. Two to three hours a day. A day. So that's even at two hours. That's 14 hours a week. That's 14 hours. Do you know what, I, what business I can start with 14 hours a week? With dedicating 14. The businesses that I have, I never had to dedicate that much time to. So here it is. The daycare centers was making us $100,000 a month. And I didn't even dedicate 14 hours a week to that. But yet a lot of people take their time and spend on social media. They take 14 hours and it's not producing anything. It's not doing anything for them. So what are you doing with your time? I tell people all the time, stay out the hole. Stay out the hole. You know, even when you're waking up, you know, in the morning, sometimes like I wake up every single day at 515. And the first thing I do, I meditate, I pray, I pray. And then at 530, I'm in the gym. So I got a gym in my house, right? And when that alarm clock goes off, bro, I'm, trust me, I'm like, oh man, here we go, you know? Yeah. But that moment right there, when you don't want to get up, that moment when you just hear something in your head telling you to, oh no, let's just chill, man. Let's just, you know, oh, you can work out another time or you can work out later. No, that's the hole. That's the hole. That voice you hear in your head telling you, no, we don't have to do this. That's the moment right there that you have to get out of the hole. You need to get up and just go do it. You know, I created every single business that I had that I have in the hole. Man, I'm pumped right now, Let's man. Go. That's so powerful, <laughs> man. That's so powerful. And we had those moments every day. And by the way, when you say you got a gym at your house, you got a gym. <laughs> People can get memberships to this, you know. But man, you know, this is a true story. Just today, man, you get in here. Yeah. You guys, you know, your brother wants to drive down. You guys got a bi another business thing going on here yeah. uh, in St. Louis, and you guys live in Chicago, uh, well, close to Chicago. And uh, big snowfall came down yeah. and took you guys several more hours to get here. First of all, of course, I appreciate you putting the effort in. But, you know, we woke up today. You know, we live out in, in the woods a little bit, and it was winter wonderland, right? It was like eight inches of snow. You know, I, I look out the window and, you know, it's still dark outside, but I could see like this don't look good. Yeah. And so, you know, alarm goes off. Same time we I get up and, you know, I go over to the window. My wife's got up, you know, she's changed her habits. You know, mm -hmm. she got up, she's going, you know, I'm just like turn the light back off so I can see outside. I was like, man, this don't look good. And, you know, the school's going to be canceled. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, let's get going. And then she got back in bed. Mm. She got back in bed <laughs> quick. Yeah, right. She got back in. I'm hitting the Denzel watch the hand. Yeah, right, right. She got back in <laughs> yeah, bed right. quick. And I went to, I was like, what are you doing? She was like, I thought you said get back in bed. I literally I didn't even say words remotely close to that. Right. You know, that was the hole. She jumped she in. She jumped it. back in. She the jumped hole. in it. But then, you know, I just reminded her because we, we just talked about this routine, you know, yeah. and really mastering our routine. We've seen revelations happen in our lives as as a result of just following this routine. And, uh, but for her, it's based on getting my son to school to kick things off, mm. right? And so, but that was the opportunity, like, let's execute, let's get up, let's still do what we gotta do. I'm definitely gonna find a way to get to the studio. My man then drove all the way and, um, you know, she got up and she just started knocking stuff out, man. You know, she, she got in, she put a toe in the hole yeah. and then she got back. So you could always rebound, you yeah. know, because that's also what I want to share with people, man, is, you know, watch out for the hole, but also know that 
if something goes wrong, it doesn't mean everything is over. All is lost. Like just pick yourself back up, learn from the from the last time, and go to the next level. Absolutely. Right? So that's two. What's another one? Make real estate real. Mm. Now, when I was okay. telling you about how I wrote down everything in my life, and I used real estate, I how I bought a building for every bill that I have. Mm -hmm. Make real estate real. To everybody listening, what would your life look like if you had a property that could take care of all your debt? I mean, just think about that, right? So if you're so the money that you make on your job, if that money was just your pocket money, if that money didn't have to go to your bills, if everything that you had was covered by your real estate, what would your life look like? Well, that's what happened in my life. Make real estate real. I made real estate real for us. I wrote down, not only did I have buy enough properties to take care of my current debt. I even said, okay, if it worked on my current debt, then it'll work on my future debt also. So we wrote down the type of life that we want to live, the type of life that we want to have one day. We didn't even have children at the time, right? In the beginning. And then that's when we said, we want to have three kids. I knew their names, you know, I knew every, I thought the boy was going to come first, but you know, <laughs> but I knew it two girls and a boy. We knew exactly what school we wanted them to go to, right? So we researched how much does that school cost? How much, does it, how much would it cost us to send our kids to a private school? We knew the type of car we want to drive, right? This went back to that vision, not just the vision, but the exposure I had from my friend, right? From going to see him. We knew that we wanted to live in a, in a, in a larger house. How much does that house cost? How much is the mortgage, the monthly mortgage to that? How much are the bills to a house like that? And we wrote all of that down. We was being very specific, right? We wrote down how much would the kids' school cost. We wrote down how many times we want to travel in a year. And then we bought enough real estate to take care of our future debt. This was debt that we didn't even create yet. Yeah. But before the debt came, we had enough real estate to already meet that debt and take care of it. Make real estate real. Make it real for you. And that's what I tell people all the time. If you, Even if you don't want to own a bunch of properties, right? If you're just saying, hey, I want to buy this car. All right, great. There's a building out there that you can buy, rent out every single month, right? And the profit that comes back to you, you can use that money to take care of this car note, right? Why take your last dollars and put it down on a car and then all of a sudden this car in five years, now all of a sudden is, you, you want a new car, right? And this car is no longer good. And then now you have to do it all over again. What if you took that money invested in a property, that's your down payment, and then the property gives you a return every single month, right? And then now, let the return take care of that car note, and then now, you still, once that five years is up or whatever, you can go get you another car, right? That building will keep on, and not only take care of you, it could take care of your kids after you pass, right? So that profit, so make real estate real. So I, a lot of tell people all the time, write down how you can use real estate in your life. You know, how you can use real estate to help you. You don't have to live check to check no more, yeah. right? It's real estate out here. Real estate not going nowhere. It's been here since the beginning of the time and it's going to be here even afterwards. Make real estate real. Man, there's two big things that I want to uh, kind of expand on with that because number one, um, I think that it's important. You had some very specific numbers, right? Yeah. And I think that the universe really operates on uh, clarity, right? So why in, why in the world would you would would the entire universe give you more for nothing, mm -hmm. right? You you it's for nothing. Oh, I want to make a million dollars. I want to make six figures. Why? What are you gonna do with it? Right. Right. You're just gonna you're gonna put a, a kink in the hose, right? You're gonna you're gonna stop the flow of all of that good circulating, mm -hmm. right? And so being clear on I'm gonna use this to fund this you know my co my my children's college. I'm yeah. gonna use this to fund you know, this um, this charity. I'm going to use this to find the car that I want. Very specific. What car is it? Exactly. Right? Get clarity. And with clarity comes power. And the second thing is, I'm going to steal your thunder a little bit here, you know, but if it isn't real estate, and by the way, so, and by the way, guys, listen to this. Listen, please hear this. My man is just sharing this out of his heart and his passion. He doesn't have a product to sell. He's not um, out here, you know, trying to direct you. He, he's not even on social media. All right. He's just sharing this and he's he's achieved so much and helped so many people on the low. All right. So just keep that in mind. But another thing I'm going to steal the thunder a little bit is 
it can be another business as well. Absolutely. You know, making Absolutely. real estate real, this could be making, you know, starting a cleaning company, mm -hmm. right? That ha you have employees or, or creating a, a, a digital product or doing work with Amazon, Amazon's associate program, and you're selling, you know, doing blog posts on cameras and whatever it might be, you can create more streams of income. But getting specific, I, I want it for this $900 amount for my rent, exactly. right? And I'm gonna cover it with this. Exactly. It can give you a lot of power to get there. So thank you so much for sharing that, man. All right, so we got three. We got three in the books. I wanna get two more, just two more, man. But we'll do that right after this quick break. So sit tight, we'll be right back. Don't sleep on sleep. Today, there is a big revolution happening to improve our sleep quality because we're understanding finally just how much our sleep quality impacts our physical performance, our brain function, and literally impacts our body composition. Sleep deprivation is something that can directly lead to increased fat gain and an inability to lose weight as well. With great sleep, we see an increased ability to burn fat, like the research that was done by the International Association for the Study of Obesity that found that our sleep quality, namely a sleep-related hormone called melatonin that everybody's heard of, increases your body's production of something called brown adipose tissue. This is a type of fat that actually burns fat. And the reason that it's brown versus the white adipose tissue is brown adipose tissue has a lot more mitochondria. And these are the energy power plants in our cells, very metabolically active tissue that we build more of when we get great sleep. Now, the issue today is getting that great sleep. And there's tons of lifestyle factors, but there's also a nutrition component. And there's a study that was published in the journal Pharmacology, Biochemistry, and Behavior that found that the renowned medicinal mushroom reishi was able to, number one, significantly decrease sleep latency. This means you fall asleep faster when you have Rishi. They also found that this increased overall sleep time for study participants. And they found that th this increased the sleep efficiency by improving the non-REM deep sleep and improving our light REM sleep as well. This comprehensive approach to improving sleep, it's not pounding our sleep into submission, what we see with conventional drugs and things of that nature, where it's kind of like pseudo sleep. This is actually improving your sleep quality, your sleep efficiency by utilizing Rishi. Now, the only Rishi that I use is from Four Sigmatic because it's dual extracted, where they're doing an alcohol extract and a hot water extract. So they're actually extracting all of the nutrients from the mushroom that you think you're getting with Company X, all right? You're actually getting those compounds. With the hot water extract, you're getting the beta-glucan related compounds. And then with the alcohol extract, you're getting more of the hormonal compounds. And I think these are really important for sleep, like the terpenes and things in that category and so much more. So make sure to use foursigmatic.com forward slash model to get your hands on this and so much more. So that's F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com forward slash model. You get 15% off their Rishi Elixir and all of their medicinal mushroom elixirs, coffees, hot cocos, and so much more. I love Four Sigmatic. I literally have them every single day, one of their different products. Today I had my Lion's Mane coffee mix. So, so good. And it has all of these benefits as well. If you're still drinking standard coffee, what are you doing? You need to get these benefits from the Four Sigmatic coffee mixes. Now, head over and check them out ASAP because these are absolutely game-changing. The coffee mix, great for in the morning. Rishi, great for in the evening and winding down. And they've got all of this research to back it up. And this is what it's all about, is having more education so that we're executing on the things that really do work, that have a clinically proven benefit, and we can actually enjoy ourselves and have a good time along the way. And again, that's foursigmatic.com forward slash model for 15% off everything. And now back to the show. All right, we're back and we're talking with Jamal King, who has an incredible story and incredible insights and really helping to look at shifting our mindset with our financial well-being. And before the break, we had covered three of these keys to the kingdom. Yeah. We're going to get two more. So what's the next one? Man, become a fortune teller. Okay. Become a fortune teller. Meaning that, you know, in the beginning, when we started this podcast, you talked about everything that I'm doing, right? Talking about all the businesses that I have, you know, you talk about the amount of money that I make and things that I'm able to do in my life, but I don't give any credit to the Jamal that's sitting here in front of you right now, right? The Jamal that's sitting you right in front of you right now is just the recipient of everything that you just talked about. But it was that Jamal that was in his 20s 
that created the vision of this Jamal, right? So the Jamal that was in his 20s had a vision of how much money he wants to make, he wanted to make when he turned 40. He had a vision on how he wanted his body to look when he turned 40. Not only did he have a vision about his health and his wealth, but he had a vision for his children who wasn't even created at the time. He had a vision for his wife and everything that that 20 year old Jamal had a vision for, I'm now living proof of it right now. So become a fortune teller, write down the type of life that you want to have for yourself. Write it down because one day your future is going to become your present. So you can literally, I took a piece of paper, Sean, and I wrote down every single thing. I was very specific with everything I did. I said that I want to, I got this thing I always say, 222, 222. That's how much I weighed when I first got on the police department at 22 years old. Right now, I am 41 years old and I'm still 222. That's the goal that I had for myself, my health wise. So every day I get up and I work out towards that goal. I'm working out. And then the thing about it, somebody said, like my guy was telling me one time, you're too serious in the gym. Why are you working out? Like you don't have to work out because I won't miss a workout, right? And he's like, well, you, you can afford to miss a workout. And I tell him, bro, you looking at me right now. You looking at the Jamal right now. But the Jamal that's 50 need me to work out right now. The Jamal that's 50 is needed. So I'm not working out right now because 40 years old Jamal need it. No, the 50 year old Jamal is going to need it because things might happen. Things are going to come about. The older you get, the more ailments happen in your life. Right. So the 50. So I'm working out for the 50 year old Jamal. I'm becoming a fortune teller. I'm helping that person out. So that's what I need everybody to do. Right. I tell people become a fortune teller, you know, help out the future. You help you out. Help out the future. You financially give yourself options. You know, go buy some real estate to give you options to help you out. You do not have to live check to check. You know, I, I, I got real estate and I keep buying property, so I'm giving my children options. Not only am I giving my children's options, I'm giving my grandchildren options right now. And my oldest child is only 14. And I promise you she ain't having no kids no time soon. <laughs> <laughs> I can promise you that one. But I know that one day she will have children. My other daughter, Jasmine, will have children. My son, Jamal Jr., he's going to have children. They're going to need me to help them out in the future. So I'm being a fortune teller with it right now. That's why I'm not being selfish. I'm not just saying, oh, I'm only going, oh, I got my house. I got my car. I got my bills paid. No, I can help out my grandchildren. You know, right now we got bank accounts for our kids right now. And we're putting money in those accounts right now because we know when they turn 20 or 30, they're going to have a business idea. We know that one day they're going to get married. We know that one day that, that, that something's going to come about and we can bless them with this. We're going to give them options. So, man, become a fortune teller. Change your future. You can do it. You got the power to do it. Do it now, though. Stop living check to check. Stop living day to day. Yeah. I love it, man. Either way, you're passing what you're doing right now to your future self. That's generational wealth, bro. Yeah. That's, that's, that's powerful, that's man. That's generational wealth. You can literally affect the next generation. And if you do it right, you can affect the next generation and the next generation. And you will never really, I will probably, me and my wife will probably never see the actual fruits of our labor. We'll never really probably see, you know, right now, my daughters right now, we said that we wanted them to go to a special school. Right now they go to the number one school in the state of Illinois, right? And my daughters speak Spanish, they speak French and Mandarin. So, and then you throw English in, that's four languages. You know, wow. <laughs> so here it is just because of the vision that we had, we seen it. And I don't mean like, like some people just think about things, right? It's a thought. I'm not talking about thoughts. I'm talking about a vision. You know, the visions that I have in my head, Sean, they're more realer than this studio right now. I see them just like how I see you sitting across from me. It's real. It's so real that when the actual vision come about, I'm like, yeah, I've seen this before. It's kind of like deja vu, right? Mm. Because I've already seen it in my head. I played it out. I tell people always, when you become a fortune teller, it's kind of like going to a movie. Let's say, that you, let's say that you go to the movies to see a movie, right? Let's say a horror movie, something really scary. And let's say that the movie's supposed to start at 7 o'clock, right? But you happen to get there a little bit early, and you get there at 6.45. And you walk in a theater, and... You see the main character in the movie, right? The main character uh, lived, right? You see things happen, but all of a sudden the main character lived. And you're like, okay, well, wow, the main character lived. And then you stay in that same movie, right? 
and when it starts mm -hmm. at seven o'clock and you're watching it from the beginning. Right. And you seeing the main character go through all of this, you know, trauma and going, you know, scary right. It's a horror movie. And you look around at all of the people in the audience. Right. All the people who are sitting there watching the movie. And they're nervous. Right. They're scared. They're nervous. But you sitting back with just this calm. You looking like, man, the dude going to live. He's going to live. Man. I seen the end. You know the end result. I know the end result. I seen the end. That's how you got to live your life. When you become a fortune teller, you're seeing the end. You're seeing the end of it. So now when you see the end of it, the beginning is easy because I already know that it's going to be all right. I know my daughters are going to be all right. Yeah. I know my grandchildren are going to be all right. Why? Because I set this up for them. I seen the end already. Yeah. And, and come a fortune teller. Some of the stories you share with me, and you know, we're getting close on time here, but you, this man, he, he lives what he talks about. When you're saying this, you really mean it. Absolutely. And you've seen example after example after example of it happening. And, you know, of course, we'll have you back on sometime, man, and share some more of your insights and, and, uh, and your wisdom, man. But let's get to that number five. Man. Number let's five. drop one more key. Number five. For us, man. Yeah, so this is, this is my favorite one. All right, so number five is free yourself. Mm. You know, a lot of people always ask me, what does free yourself mean? So one of the times when I went to go visit my buddy that played in the NFL, um, he was like, he had a bunch of NFL guys with him and all these guys was making $200,000 a week, you know, $100,000 a week, driving fancy cars. And here I am making $1,200 every two weeks as a police officer, right? Yeah. And so he was like, AJ, man, we all about to go out to this steak restaurant, man. You know, come on, let's go. And so I'm like, all right, you know, cool, whatever. And so on the, on the way there, we pull up to the restaurant and I'm getting kind of nervous because I'm like, man, this place looks like exclusive, right? You know, it's like a fancy restaurant. It's got it's nice not, cars parked It's not out. the Red Lobster. It's not Red Lobster, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a serpent turf. They're not going to give you the vibrator, <laughs> no. uh, uh -uh. the pager. Yeah. No, this was kind of <laughs> like where the guy came to the door. The manager was like, you know, gentlemen, your table is over here. And uh, took us off to a back room. And I remember, man, it had dim lights and I was just nervous the whole time I was there because I'm like, okay, cool. This is an expensive restaurant. I'm only making $1,200, you know, and I'm over here counting my money. And I'm just like, uh, you know, depending on how much this costs, you know, man, this could be my light bill. You know, mm. this could be the gas bill. Yeah. So I remember just feeling uncomfortable. And um, we sat down and it was crazy because here I am with all these NFL guys. And the second we sat down, Everybody started calling out what they wanted. The waitress, she was bringing water and just, you know, sitting the water on the table. And the guys were like, man, we hungry. We know exactly what we want. We know exactly what we want to eat. And I'm sitting here and I'm kind of, you know, lost. Like, you know, man, she ain't even put out the menus yet. Right? And then, so the waitress was like, okay, you guys hungry? Let me go around the table. And so she started just getting orders. And she's like, my buddy, my buddy was like, hey, give me filet mignon. My other guy was like, hey, give me a T-bone steak. You know, another guy, uh, bacon wrapped shrimp. You know, they just call this stuff out. Pour the house steak. She came around to me and was like, sir, what could I get you? I was like, I need a menu. <laughs> you know, I need a menu. Yeah, no I'm doubt. like, oh, I need, you know, I, I need to know, you know, what's going on. And my buddy was like, hey, Jay, just, just get whatever you want, man. And I know that I knew that if, you know, if the bill came, you know, he would take care of it. But I wasn't that type of guy. I always wanted to stun him on. You know, even if he made the gesture of paying for it, I wanted to be able to, you know, no, I got it. I got it. Matter of fact, I'm the type of guy where I wanted to pay for everybody. I knew I couldn't afford to pay, right, the, right, right. you know, that time. But I just didn't want to lean on him like that. Right. And so, Sean, I really didn't know what I wanted to eat. And, you know, and they were like, dog, just get whatever you want. This is a steak place. This is a steak restaurant. Whatever you want, bro. And I was like, I, I, I was like really at a loss of words. I really didn't know. You know, I wasn't being funny. I, you know, I just did not know what I wanted to eat. And so I remember my boy, his friends was all, you know, they nudging each other and like, man, what's up with this dude? You know, what's up with your boy? And uh, he was like, Jay, man, you're like, you embarrassing me, dog. Like, mm -hmm. dog, just get what you want to eat. And I was like, bro, I, I don't know. And then the waitress was right there and I was like, ma'am, I just stopped talking to him. And I looked up, yeah. ma'am, can I get a, a menu, please? And the waitress was like, she, you know, reached, went over to the table next to us, picked up a, a menu and kind of threw it at me. And it was embarrassing, bro. It was embarrassing because when I opened up that menu, my eyes automatically went to the right side. You know what the right side is, right? That's where the price is at. That's where the price is at, bro. That's where the price is at. So my eyes automatically went to where the prices were. So I would, I would pick, I would choose the items on a menu 
that I could afford. And then I would say, okay, this is the best decision out of the choices that I could only afford. Yeah. See, I really didn't know what I wanted to eat, right? Once I looked at the right side of the menu of the prices, then I would say, oh, okay, I can afford this. So then this is what I want to eat. At that moment, I was like, what else in life am I looking to the right side of the menu on? What else in life am I making decisions solely based off the price? And that was the best item on the menu. Or what you wanted. Or what you really want to yeah. eat. You know, I'm picking, I'm choosing items only what I could afford. So imagine how many people go through life with, with making decisions based solely off the price and not really what's best for them. How many people send their kids to a school probably because they believe that, you know, it's the cheapest school and not necessarily the best school. So I tell people all the time, live life on the left side of the menu because on the left side is way sweeter. You know, and I'm not telling you to live outside your means, but I'm telling you to look at other possibilities like real estate to help out, to help you to make better decisions, to give you more options in life. Because that's what it's all about. It's about options, right? So in that very moment, man, I said, I'm no longer going to live life on the right side of the menu. I'm going to find a way. My wife deserves better. My children deserves better. You know, my wife, here it is. I'm, I'm taking her to restaurants only because I can afford the, the stuff on the items on the menu. And I'm not really taking her to the places that's the best place, in my opinion. Going to Red Lobster. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I'm like, she deserves better. You know, my children deserve better. And so what I did, I went ahead and I created ways where now my family, we live on the left side of the menu. When we vacation, we don't look at the cost. We're in a position now where we don't have to look at the cost. We go to a place because it's the best place and not because it's the cheapest place to go. It's a difference when you go travel somewhere and you're staying at the worst hotel and you're flying in the worst airline, you got the worst seat, and you're just happy to get there, right? Some people are just like that restaurant. They're happy just to be in the restaurant. You can afford a salad, so that's the only thing you're going to get is the salad, right? Oh, but yet you, you ate at that restaurant. Unlimited salad at Olive Garden. <laughs> right. Unlimited breadsticks. <laughs> exactly. And so for some people, they're just happy just to be in the building. Yeah. You know, but for me, I was like, no. We have to, I have to change the culture. Yeah. You know, we have to start living life on the left side of the menu. And so, yeah, that's what I always say. Live life on the left side of the menu. Because trust me when I tell you, bro, the left side is way sweeter. Man, dude, I, I'm just so grateful, man. And uh, I even heard new parts of these stories today. And man, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, being that person who is looking out for the Jamal you are today you know, who, who stepped up and started to say yes to that bigger vision, for giving yourself that exposure, for it, when you were in the hole to really work on something special, yeah. you know? And I love how you said what people were doing in the hole, that's who they became, you know? And man, I'm just very, very happy to, to know you and to see your story and to Appreciate be a part of this story at this point, man. It's just, it's just really incredible, man. I just want you to understand how incredible you are. You're an exceptional, Human I being, man. I mean, a lot coming from you because yeah. you are exceptional. <laughs> Thank you, know, you so brother. I appreciate, Thank you, I appreciate it, man. Iron sharpens iron. No doubt. Yeah. Or it'll dull. Oh, oh, Turn into on, a butter Sean, knife. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> so listen, final question for you. Yes. What is the model that you are here to set for other people with how you live your life personally? Yeah, bro, that all things are possible. That all things are possible. You know, you, but you have to believe. You know, here it is. I'm a Chicago police officer, right? I'm a blue collar worker, nine to five, blue collar. I didn't go to a special school, didn't go to a special university, but yet I still made my dreams of becoming a millionaire my reality. I still did it. I didn't have to go to the NFL. You know, I didn't have to win a lottery. I didn't have to wait for one of my parents or somebody to pass away. I did it now. I was able to take care of my family with the little I had. You know, I took the money that I had and I, and I created a vision for myself. And then I stood, I, I held on to that vision until it became a reality. And so I want everybody else to know that if I did it from where I'm at, then you definitely can do it from wherever you at. Bro, thank you so much for sharing your story, for sharing your wisdom. And uh, thanks for making the trip. 
you man, know, through I the snow, you. man, to be here. Appreciate you, man. Hey, thank thanks you, for man. having me, man. Anytime. My Anytime. pleasure, man. Look My forward pleasure. to being back. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show today. I know you got a lot of value out of this episode, and I hope that this really sparks a change in your thinking. And also, it begins with belief. You know, this is something that he's talking about right off the bat. And I know you probably got the same question that I had when I first started to hear some of this story. Why are you still a police officer <laughs> after all of this? But you know what? To get that story, to hear the rest of why he's still a police officer, he's about to retire in just a couple of months. He's actually going to be retiring when He's in Jamaica with all of us, and it is the Phenomenal Life event is where you're going to get to meet Jamal, hang out with us. He's got a, he's going to be teaching a session. I'm going to teach a session and some other stuff as well. We're going to do some workshops, probably do a live podcast. And so to come and hang out with us one week, we're going to spend an entire week together in Jamaica. First of all, it's Jamaica. Mm. All right. Come on. So it's PhenomenalLifeJamaica.com. That's where you can get information about the event. It's gonna be a full immersion and not just these principles, it's that exposure, absolutely. right? It's that exposure that Jamal talked about. And these kind of things are absolutely priceless. All right, so pop over there, check it out, phenomenallifejamaica.com. And that's coming up in February, all right? Into, into February, into March, all right? Seven day, I think it might even be a seven or eight day uh, adventure together. You know, this is a great opportunity to, to come out, also bring your family, changing that exposure. This is one of the things I did for my kids. We did the cruise last year, Phenomenal yes. Life Cruise. Went to all these different islands. My son, I didn't leave the country until I was like 35 or something, you know? And to, to have these experiences and to, and to see the growth and the different change in the mindset of my family is just so powerful. So I'd love for you to come and hang out with us. And listen, we've got some incredible guests coming up, but I want you to really take this to heart today because Jamal shares some very, very powerful and special information. And I want you to, to start to think bigger than you ever have before, to really expand your vision. This is something we talked about before the show, you know, and starting to see that vision clearly. And that's the key is clarity and giving yourself permission to want what you really want despite the circumstances. Listen, real talk. Red Lobster is kind of delicious, all right? <laughs> we talk about the, the cheddar biscuits, all right? They bring it to the table. You get full before the entree even gets there, you know, but that's one way of being. But if you want more or if you want different, it's really about options. That's what it's really about when it boils down to it, all right? So whatever it is for you, whatever you feel called to do, let's just step up in this area so that we can get to a level of, of peace, of peace of mind, so that we're not cutting corners and we're stressing ourselves out when we do not have to have this as a stressor, all right? And it comes from immersion, exposure, vision, making it real for yourself, and, you know, just changing that blueprint, all right, at the end of the day. So, again, I hope you got a lot of value out of this episode. If you did, share this out with your friends and family on social media. Tag me. Let me know what you thought of the episode. I'll share it with Jamal because he's... You can't get to him unless you got the bat phone <laughs> or unless you're in Jamaica. All right. So we got some incredible guests coming up, incredible show topics. So make sure to stay tuned. All right. I appreciate you so much. Take care. Have an amazing day. And I'll talk with you soon.